Welcome to Light Talks. We're pre-recording this today because Martin is shooting the new George Clooney movie. So thank you, Martin, for taking a free Sunday. Martin Lua ASC has an incredible body of work. It goes from feature films, music videos, commercials, and all look visually so different. But everything is driven by one thing, by storytelling. So it's a real big pleasure and honor to be able to talk to Martin today. Welcome, Martin. How's shooting going? Is it okay? Yeah, it's good. We're three weeks in. We have another four weeks to go. This is not such a big thing. Okay. But, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the main question that I wanted to ask you is, it's been so impressive for me to see how you build stories. And it's not just about one frame. It's about how the whole story evolves in, in visual language. And I was wondering, how how do you plan that? I don't know how to, it's hard to say. I need to get a feeling for the story. I need to get a feeling for the environment. For me, it's very hard to say before a film shoot starts what it will be, because it will be, um, you know, very, I rarely shoot at home. So every time I go to a new place, I shoot, uh, I live in Berlin, but I shoot, my last films were in Italy or we shot in Iceland or England or, you know, all over the place. So, so it's not like um, I can come back to familiar ground so much. So I need to go to places, see that, talk to the director and it needs to evolve. And usually for me, it's more coming from a feeling rather than, um, you know, photography references or, um, or you know, other films who are, are inspirations. I try to build it on a feeling and that feeling needs to develop over time. When you prep the movie, right? Before you even take the movie, let's even go a step further back. Because if you look at throughout the movies you've done, I mean, the quality is just incredible how you, how you keep it up. So that's, you know, even before you get to a location, how do you, how do you pick that? How do you pick your pictures? I pick my pictures mainly based on the story, on the script. If I love the script, if I have something to relate to, um, then it's easier to follow. And then it's easier to, to um, if, also if, if I don't understand the story, I usually feel I'm not the right person to tell that story. So, um, um, but if there's something there I like, if there's characters and if the story moves me, then I love to dive in. And, and then I also love to, you know, forget everything I've done before. My, my films have been quite different, like Control is very different to Countess, to Harry Brown, and they're all basically uh, quite different in style and, and quite different in tone and quite different in any theme. And I love that. I love that we get the chance to do that. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's um, to get these kind of jobs and such different jobs, because for so many people, you know, it's about being put into a box and, you know, I'm good at, you know, I don't know, yogurt commercials. And then they have a hard time getting out of that, even if, if it gives them a, you know, a steady income. How, how has that been for you with going with this vast amount of, of different kinds of ways of telling a story and being booked for them? What I did early on, um, I said no quite often, like, like, hmm. I don't know, 20 years ago, um, I, you know, everything was going very well. I did a lot of commercials in Germany and um, I did a lot of music videos at the time. I had done my first feature film, but I was like, I don't want to do so much what's expected or what's there now. So I, at that time, I did a lot of commercials in England because they were more story driven and they were more versatile, they were more creative and not so much cliche and then what you would expect. So that gave me a big variety of, of jobs and I met a lot of people out there. And and then it's it's who you meet along the way. I've always done commercials and music videos and then um, uh, long form. And on music videos, for example, I met... Um, I met Anton Corbein through Herbert Grönemeyer, who introduced us. And, and then we did some music videos for Herbert. And then I started doing all this great work with Anton. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And so, so it's hard to say how to get there, but um, you shouldn't just do what, uh, what brings you money or what, what keeps you busy. You should also say no. And that leaves space for other things to happen. Mm, that's very true. How's it been technically? Because even if you look 
it's just no matter if you take the Grönemeyer video or 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 some other stuff, it's you always have the feeling you feel so comfortable in the technical environment because visually it's so different, right? Or car commercials sometimes it's like super speedy or so in the technical yeah. car with them, right? And there's a different skill set required for all of these. How do you get comfortable in in so many different variations of of styles? I think that's the fun of it that you can do all those. Usually, when you drive in, you do something you haven't done. Um, if it's technical, it's very, uh, it's not very easy. You need uh, a lot of people who advise you, who tell you, oh, this is what we could do, or this is what we could do. Uh, you need special, well, high, highly educated specialists in that. And then they might give you tips or you see things you haven't done before. But for me, I don't think the technical things are easy because it's, it's like, um, it's just technique. So, so it's a little bit of a craft and craft is um, easier determined. If you go to films and, and, and the more creative side, then it comes to um, getting the right tone for the project. And that I think is sometimes more difficult. When you're trying to find a tone for a story, um, do you find there's certain ways that helps you sync with the director or, or producer even or or, or your crew? I start with uh, talking to the director, obviously, talking through the story, talking to what's important to him in the story, you know, what kind of, uh, what's his point of view, you know, we, we, whose story to, are we telling and how do we want to tell it? Do we want to, you know, have everything out there in the open or do we want to keep secrets to discover later or something like that? That's important. And then I also like to talk to production early on because I need to know my framework. I mean, uh, my, my, the space in which we're doing it. So, so do we have a lot of money? Do we have no money? Um, if we have no money, then we have to be more creative maybe in getting there. And um, coming back to the short projects, music videos are good help because we did incredible stuff for no money. And we did some good stuff for a lot of money, but um, I, I've done a lot of things where I know, oh, okay, we can do this with a single light. We just walk here, we do that, or you know, or we can do, uh, or we need to, you know, um, we can get away with night for day in a forest rather than putting big lights and 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 uh, you know having a limited area to shoot. It's all these things where you feel like, yeah. That, that that's what I need. I mean, I need my director and then to get in sync with him. And then I need to figure out um, what can we actually do on this production or that production. Yeah. Do you still go back and forth between different kinds of bud budgets? Or do you kind of just in terms of your career, kind of happy you don't have to grab a silly light? <laughs> no, I don't mind that. I think, see, my... Um, I haven't done many music videos lately, but the last one I did was like four or five years ago. And that's the, the uh, and on that one, you know, we shot two days and I had one camera assistant. I think I had one grip person for half a day on those two days. And we had, uh, I had one lighting person. We used two or three lights over the whole thing. And um but I loved it because it was so free because you could do, you could just go and shoot. And, and it was basically, um, I loved the story. I loved the, the director and it was a great inspiration. I loved doing that. And, um, you know, the film I'm doing now is much smaller budget than the last one, but it's a good story. And also it's working with a director I know again, so. That's a tricky question. Do you have the feeling sometimes like we all are proud of what we do and there's a certain amount of ego that that is that happens on the set, you know, you need it to push to get something through. Do, do you sometimes. How should I say I've seen a lot of people that that are driven by having 10 trucks and say that's my ego or they, they set something through how how is that for you if you say look I'm, I'm happy with one light or 10 lights, how does that you know inflict and in having in you know in working with crews and, and and also i think with productions as well and, and commercials I'd, I'd say as well 
I think that you can have that ego there, and then um, I just think it limits your way to work because you, if you have all that, for example, if you were working with ten trucks, you need to move ten trucks. You need to move all these people. You, you know, you can't quickly say, "Oh, um, you know, let's just do something small over here," because you, you, there's hundred people waiting for you. Um, I don't know. I, I that part. I like it to be versatile because I think it's it keeps the door open for so many nice things. Um, when we did Harry Brown, that's like 12 years ago. That was my first film shot on video and that was for budget reasons. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have had work with Michael Caine, but it was, you know, it didn't matter. I thought I wanted to tell the story. I loved the director um, and I loved um, project so we did it with um in that framework and when you when you then are on set and you're doing no matter in what scaled size you operate yourself you told me the last time how do you often i have the feeling that you know you dive into into how should i say you're in one scene and it's just getting this one little piece right but it's always you know within the bigger picture and uh, how do you how do you maintain that if you're so having to do everything, you know, you're, you're operating yourself as well, plus all the communication that's going on. Oper operating myself comes from, I think, the way I've gone, because um, I hardly had operators. Uh, I worked with operators on two projects, and it's always more stressful. I mean, what I do often is on, on catch or on other, you know, counterpart, also on Midnight Sky, I, had, I always have a second operator. Um, and mm -hmm. then we quite often when we can, you know, on the Midnight Sky, we had, were shooting with a seven-year-old girl. So um, I tend to get an operator who does B camera and Steadicam. And um, um, that's what I usually have. And sometimes if we try it or if we have to do splinter units, that's the person I would ask to do that. I don't have... A, strong relationship to operators I've, because I've not worked that way. And for me, it's just another, I just love to be at the camera because that's where everything comes together. You see the actors, you, you know, you build a relationship with the actors, which I think is very hard when, if you're only sitting, for example, in, in a tent looking at monitors and then uh, working with a DIT in there, I could not do that. I think that would be way too detached for me. How do you sync yourself with the second uh, with the second camera? Do you have always do you always try to keep a visual contact to his monitor to see what's going on, or do you have people you distrust them? You have people you trust, and I also, you know, on on the last few projects, I always had monitors on my camera showing the other cameras. So I could see, you know, I sometimes could have a glance and say, oh, no, 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 you know, because it's a, you, it's this thing you say, you do a close up over there and you do, and I do a close up from here. And, and sometimes it's the height or the angle, or sometimes it's also how people stand. And so it's the logical thing might not be the most strongest image. So, so you go like, ah, oh, maybe we can do this a little bit. So I'm, uh, pretty much involved in the second camera. Mm, mm. And and from the viewpoint now, uh, as a gaffer, do you have uh, the gaffer with you, standing behind you, or do you have him like on the monitor to check the images and go back and forth? Um, on the project I'm doing now, I do something which I haven't done before. I have him at the monitor usually because that's also we're shooting with COVID. So we have limited amount of numbers on set. And what I haven't done before, what I love now, you know, we're working with intercom all the time. So if it's complex sets or, we, you know, if we're prepping two things, I can talk to my gaffer while he's looking at the monitor and asking, you know, do you think this is good or should we do this? Or, and it's a, I love it because it's such a, you can run the set so quietly. I used it on crane shots and on other stuff, but not, not to run a whole show. And now I like it a lot. Interesting. So basically, you have the gaffer on your ear all the time in, with the communication. Yeah, I have my gaffer, my AC, my DIT, my key grip on this show, always on intercom. That's, I, I think it's so key, the, the quiet set that you're referencing. It's always, for me, always such a headache when you've got actors and you really feel they're still in the scene. And mm -hmm. then the ladder has to move in. 
and to be able to keep setups in a way that it can do things and manipulate it quietly in the background, I think is a challenge, but so rewarding at the end of the day. Really, um, that's a good discovery from, on this project. Mm. Um, I just want to step back for one moment where we, where we started off with, uh, when we look at uh, the commercials you've done, it is also uh, incredible. If you just take Angry Birds, which seems like uh, such a, a tech-driven thing, and then you have like commercials like like the Nike one, for example, which is more very towards, you know, a different kind of storytelling, but still in lighting, you still keep it, you still feel it's a commercial, right? Where did that actually come from to get those different kinds of skill sets? Did you build them from job to job or were you just quietly in the background getting, getting knowledge together? No, I think that comes from job to job and that comes from Quite often on commercials, you get references, you get um, treatments with a lot of imagery in there, and that's that's your starting point. And then you come to location and you realize, okay, uh, I don't know, Angry Birds, we were on two islands in the Bahamas, and uh, some of those pics, the, the real pics we shot with, basically, were wild animals who lived on that beach. And there was a guy who said, oh, yeah, yeah, these pigs can do anything you want. I, I know these pigs are for 20 years. They can do anything. And of course, that works only for two hours because then they have eaten all you gave them <laughs> and then they're lying around or disappear. And so, so you have to, you know, uh, we try to do what we can with very small uh, gear on that beach. And also, the, you know, everything had to get there by boat and, and it was a whole big operation, but to do testing ahead of time after, for example, picking up locations and trying to figure out the style. Depends, depends on the project, depends on the challenges. We did not, so, you know, on commercials, you don't rarely do testing. I do test, say, uh, yeah, for features more. If it's more special techniques or special look you're after, yeah. I found it interesting on Catch-22 because when I start looking at it, it was like such a, a high key, but in terms of emotional, it was just like a little bit happy lighting, I'd, I'd, I'd say. And I was, I was a little bit surprised by how the story goes on, but it's, it's somehow the longer you watch it and the more this guy just goes nuts there, the more it just becomes a, a, a tie around your neck watching it because this happy mood is still here but he's just going down, which gets so strong when he's standing there naked. Was that something you tested or was it just talked about? That I did some stills, I did um, digital stills on the costume test and then I processed those in very different ways. And, and this, what we discovered was that look, which is pretty close to what the show looks like. And we wanted this to be really, um, a stark contrast, you know, when you're on the ground, it's happy, it's more formal, it's bureaucracy, it's, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, there's a lot of dialogue, and then we wanted that to be strong, more strict, we move sometimes, but it's smooth moving uh, with a camera or with a dolly, um, and then when it's in the plane, it's very small, it's um, handheld cameras, and then, you know, we use uh, fuselage, on a gimbal for some of the shots, um, but it, that was basically really intimate. It was me and my focus puller in the plane. Was that studio, or how did you how did you set up shots like that? Because there's a yeah, there's some significant plane stuff in it. Um, we built the airbase in Sardinia, so that's where we had a real our main set. Basically, was there. Then we did some location work in. Um, uh, uh, near Rome, and um, and the, all the interiors of the plane are usually in uh, Rome in, in the studio. We had a big gray void around, uh, gray screen we used. We didn't use blue screen or any of that because it also, it's hard to get rid of blue. So I was happy and lucky when my visual effects supervisor told me no blue. And we had like, uh, we had a soft ceiling with, um, I think, 200 space lights from the top. Um, and then we, we, going in there, we figured out this is the scene, then we would switch off some of the space lights on this side when we're looking that way. So we had always like a soft overcast film. And then I was put, I think, 420Ks in each corner so we could swap the sun if we, you know, without moving lifts around so much. 
you know, it was always the contrast between, like I said, bureaucracy, but then in the sky, people die, people disappear, they don't come back, they explode. And that is what burns into his mind. That needed to be a motivation for him to go nuts and to really fight the system so hard as he would on the ground. And that's why that had to be getting to your guts as well. So that's how we tried to do that. Yeah, I've, I've always felt that what that space that you're explaining only works if you're so if, if if you're just free you know in your mind nothing's stressing you and and you just have to you're open you can be open-minded to that way and i've always felt that a lot of energy uh needs to go into creating like the safe space where you can create or where even mistakes can happen or where you can work problems or issues out together is that something that 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 you uh intentionally drive or is that just comes along with with your personality i think what i did you know early on when when we when i started travel for pro to travel for projects um very often i would go to eastern european countries and then it would, could be stressful because some people you know mm. um, at that time maybe you know I, 20 years ago in ukraine to do a job you had a crew which probably was not that educated. Yeah, and and I got angry because things wouldn't work, or you know, it will, and so, so you. But, but it, you know, you might scare people, or you might get loud, and and I don't think it ever helps. Uh, I learned that if you explain people, then they got a chance to learn, and they pick it up, and they follow, like to follow you. I don't like, think people who are scared of you will be a great help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to, at, uh, towards the end, now, uh, catch up a little bit more on, on the lighting. Is there is there stuff that you go to specifically? Like you're saying, you were doing only tungsten in the studio. Is that just something that are there certain things you that repeat that that repeat themselves throughout your jobs? Where you're feeling that's your style, or that's where you, where you have the feeling it gets best? It's hard to say. Uh, soft lights, you know, but I don't, uh, I, I try not to get stuck on one because it's like, you know, on this film we did, uh, right now we use a couple of light tiles from... Uh, yeah, light gear. Light gear, exactly. And then we built soft boxes with that, which I hadn't done before. And it's amazing because they're so light and so you can build them so quickly, you know, four, eight by uh, two, uh, light mats in there. It's a really beautiful softbox and so quick. Uh, no. It's a revelation. So um, on on Midnight Sky, we built a big, huge, we had a huge Roscoe rear projection screen. We put about 500 sky panels behind that. And then um, through the rear projection, you could basically create a blue sky or, or uh, northern lights just by uh, picking pixels from a still photo photo, and program that into the wall. And then that allowed us to do a very convincing snowstorm in a studio, you know, where we needed to match what we did in Iceland, um, what we couldn't finish in Iceland. And no, I try not to get too stuck on things. I love to use textiles to light through, you know, now we do a lot with magic cloth, but I've, you know, I've sent very often, I've sent people to Ikea to get Bleach and unbleached uh, um, muslin, muslin yeah. to yeah. go through to throw that over kino flows and then have it you know take the edge off, make it less like a look less light. I like that. I, I was watching an interview uh, that you did, and the and the guy was asking you, "Well, you're shooting in the snowstorm in Iceland. How do you light that?" And you look at him and say, "You don't." <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a nice one. And I was wondering, like, if this stuff happens, right? Because obviously you plan for something and it doesn't go along. And I mean, that's just significant because the snowstorm is such a big thing. Do you change the way the film will look just by stuff not working out? Are you finding something new within what you're doing? I think that one was, yes, we had to change a little bit because we you imagine the snowstorm like a gray void and stuff, but then we were in there and it was actually not really a snowstorm because it was basically, um, it was harsh winds on the glacier. So we were, um, I think probably 20, 30 meter high. Uh, it was snow blowing over the glacier. 
but um, it was not really a snow falling. So, so it was in the hard winds. So, so you would see the light coming through every now and then and was shift in brightness. So, so that's what we saw. We thought um, it was incredibly harsh on people because it was like, you know, the actors had to get it, um, all the snow into their faces and it was hard. But um, what we learned from that is it's not just gray. You know, it shifts the density of the clouds or the snow shifts. So sometimes you would feel the sun, sometimes you would not. So when we had to match a few more shots on stage, what we did is we used that big wall of uh, gray. We um, uh, asked my guys to program a pattern, uh, you know, something which is so, so there would be um, life in, in the brightness in the background. And then we added uh, a lot of um, smoke and, and wind to the foreground on our actors. But because the, life, um, the light in the background shifts, it all of a sudden doesn't look like a studio anymore. And that's something I learned while seeing that. So um, I think you have to have an open mind. I, I sadly cannot recapture now from where I found that image or what, what movie it was, but it was like a lot of trees and it was outside and it was like almost like nighttime and it was a lot of haze going over a hill or something like that. And I, I think I started once or twice. Is that something you, you do for night exteriors? Did you add haze and stuff to get more atmosphere? If it fits the story, I think yeah. I did one where, you know, in, in American Pastoral, we have a uh, we have a morning shot and it's a person going through a landscape and there's fog on the ground and then she's going to a barn or something. And we just were there at the right time at the first wow. light in the morning. And it was really, we were wow. so, because we had this layer of haze on the ground. Wow. Uh, haze or smoke outside make me always nervous because it's, you know, if there, you have to be so lucky that the wind is doing you a favor or you know, yeah. otherwise it looks quite often it's quite silly. Yeah. Do you use it inside to like get more fill or yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I think quite often it helps sets and then especially studio sets, it helps them to make it make it look more real. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking in terms of you know, soft boxes up in the top. Do you is that something that you use kind of stage for? Did you that you're easy to move around with actors and change things? Do you light like that or do you is it again about the story to set up one shot and go to the next and then you relight in terms of the dance of the day with, with... I try to I try to figure out the light for the room and then move within that. It's, it's I don't want to light every shot. And if I need to add something, it's something small, usually I move around. But usually I try to get the room ready and then keep the energy going. I don't want to do um, I mean, if you do pretty shots and, and everything's perfect, it's like, yeah, it's great, but you can also lose the flow on the set and and, and uh, for actors and for, for everybody else, it's, it becomes draining and you feel that. And then, but if you keep it going, you know, it's, it's nice. I think it's a better energy in general. And when you're then going, the whole room is lit and you're going into specific shots and you do like small changes and stuff. How do you how do you know if you like it what you're doing you know sometimes you light something and it just <laughs> it just doesn't feel as perfect as as you had it in mind do you then just let go no I try not to let go but sometimes I don't find the solution fast enough sometimes I, on my way home I go like that's how I should have done it this is the that's the mistake or this is why it doesn't feel right uh, you know quite often you get away with those shots but what I also I'm not shy anymore to say. Uh, this just doesn't work. Sorry, give me a minute. And in terms of uh, deciding when you like a light and how it's lit in a room, and it, do, is that something you reference back to? Like, well, we talked about this, this fits there, or is it just, you know, a feeling? Is it just when it feels right, the light? No, I think good lighting quite often is um, quite simple, or it looks simple, but, it, you know, good lighting doesn't look complicated, usually. If it's very complicated, it very often it looks a bit manicured or something. I was just thinking like we're, you're shooting the first take and then sometimes I've always noticed 
it's the first time everybody sees what's going to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you say, Ooh, this needs to be changed. Or there's these small little nuances that make, that make a big difference. Is that something that's just gut feeling for you? Or do you follow some kind of a pattern? We discuss this, we want to get there. No, it's gut feel in the moment. And if you feel it's not hitting the mark, then you go through, um, oh, what do we do? Switch off this, switch off that, make this strong, make that. And, um, and then you have to see if you, um, if it fits in the moment to intervene there, mm. you know. Sometimes directors might say, oh no, I wanna get going because I need the energy now. And then I think the energy should be, and the energy and the performance should be the first thing there, so. Yeah, absolutely. Hey Martin, that's uh, it. Sums it up so so. Yeah, it sums it up totally to what what my experience has been watching the movies. Thank you so much for doing this. This has uh, been been fantastic. Okay. So, uh, well, cool. Anytime. Thank you very much for having me.